aging phenomenon itself is a kind of inflammatory syndrome. And a lot of the cutting edge research in this area is to try to minimize the impact of that inflammatory change. What if the key to understanding your longevity was hidden in the electrical signals of your brain? Whenever you have uh, a difference in the charges between inside and outside a cell, you create a voltage. It's like electric. It is electric, exactly the same. Melin sits down with Professor Boulou, a senior physician at Hook, whose research is reshaping how we think about aging. The brain is one of the last of the frontiers of the unknown unknowns, you name it. Uh, the brain has a direct influence on these through the nervous system. Professor Boulou brings cutting-edge insights into what keeps us sharp, resilient and thriving. Hi, Professor Bolo. Thank you for joining us today. Could you tell us your role here? So I'm the senior physician at Hook. I oversee the workings of a group of physicians to general practitioners and a specialist sports physician in integrating information gathering about patients yeah. and then coming out with recommendations uh, in terms of their future health pathways and trying to meet their goals, trying to define uh, objectives for them in future. And I make sure that everything is evidence-based and safe practice. For those people who are not really familiar with endocrinologist, could you explain us in the simplest way? What is it? What, why it matters for us? So endocrinology is a science of internal secretions. It's one of the major systems of the body that integrates the whole function of the body. So you can think of every hormone is, a, is a basically a, a messenger. What it does is to enable tissues to respond, usually through, a, through the bloodstream, and it influences the functions of the brain, of the heart, of virtually all the tissues of the body. And there are several glands which secrete hormones into the bloodstream. For example, the thyroid, the parathyroids, the adrenal glands, the ovaries, the testes, and indeed the, the master organizer of the, this hormonal system is a gland in the base of the brain called the pituitary. Mm. And that is the master of the orchestra that determines how the other glands work. Could you break down what type of hormone we have and is there a differentiate from woman to man? The hormonal systems in men and women are identical with two notable exceptions. Women have ovaries and they produce the female hormone estrogen and progesterone. And men have testicles that produce sperm and the male hormone testosterone mm. and its derivatives. But otherwise, the systems are working in identical manners in terms of the way they're regulated. Could you walk us through the hormonal change for a woman? Because what I heard is in certain day you are at your prime and you should make more important decision accommodating to that calendar. It is partially true. Uh, there are behavioral effects of female hormones and the notable difference between men and women is that women cycle. Men have a fairly constant day-by-day -day rhythm of hormone production, whereas in women there is a menstrual calendar mm. so that the brain through the pituitary regulates how the ovaries work in terms of follicle development for, to make the woman fertile, then the preparation of the lining of the womb in case she fertilizes an egg and she falls pregnant. And these are changes which occur over a four-week period. And in mid-cycle, which is where you actually release the egg, there are changes behaviorally in women which make them more susceptible to falling pregnant. All to their behavior, their fertility uh, changes in mid-cycle. They're at their most fertile when they're releasing their egg. And so that's a, a really fundamental difference between men and women. It's this cyclical change. Some women experience pain, for example, in mid-cycle, at the time they release an egg. Uh, but other women also in the build-up to menstruation can experience a lot of abdominal cramping and discomfort. The technical term for this is dysmenorrhea. 
and uh, it can be really troublesome in women. But it's due to mainly sort of painful contractions of the womb itself, a muscle. And I think in the background of some inflammatory change, that could make it a particularly unpleasant experience in women. You have mentioned the, about the brain-body connection. We just got a test result from Vavi Brainwave yeah. scan. Could you walk us through what we got from those score? Well, the good news is that we haven't found anything bad about your brain health. So the report from this WAVI brain function test, which basically collects information about the electrical activity at different points uh, over the, the brain, uh, allows us to look at the voltage, the degree of electrical activity in the brain, and its regional distribution from to back. And, um, you were able to look at some key measurements with you. One was the overall brain voltage. Uh, then we looked at the brain reaction time and then the physical reaction time. So all this was done by an external cue and then seeing what the brain response was in terms of its electrical activity and where the electrical activity was occurring. Can you tell us what is voltage? Basically, whenever you have uh, a difference in the charges between inside and outside a cell, you create a voltage. It's like electric. It is electric, exactly the same. And you can measure that, and it's measured in volts or microvolts. And from that, you can deduce the activity of individual areas of the brain. And the EEG, or the electroencephalogram, which forms the base of the WAVI helmet, which is collecting electrical information from different parts of the brain allows us to compute the activity going on at specific points in the brain. And your own results show that you are within range for your overall voltage, your brain reaction time and your physical reaction time. So this kind of test is useful, I think, for, as, a, as a baseline for, for individuals that can be tracked over time, over months or years. And it's particularly found its use in patients who've sustained injury to the brain, for example, concussive injury. But it's also quite useful in uh, identifying trends which suggest an anxiety state, which suggests that patients, for example, may have a, an ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder type of problem, and can also be a very early detector of abnormal brain function, which might, for example, denote a susceptibility to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, for example. So if I test it out and I find abnormal visuals, I should go then have a more comprehensive test? Is that what you mean? This should complement other assessments mm -hmm. and uh, forms a baseline against which you can then make recommendations and see whether by actions that you take in terms of your lifestyle, your eating habits, your exercise capability, your happiness and your mental health, yeah. sometimes medications uh, can all resolve some of the abnormalities that you can detect on a, a wavy scan. Could you tell us a little bit about our mind and body connection? Yeah, it's a, it's a really fundamental question. So the brain is one of the last of the frontiers of the unknown unknowns, but it has a way of communicating with the rest of the body by two main ways. One is through hormone secretion, and there are hormones released from the pituitary gland that influence virtually all the organs of the body. And the other one is by direct nervous, that is electrical signals, which innovate, which supply different organs of the body. So heart, gut, liver, you name it. Uh, the brain has a direct influence on these through the nervous system, which innovates, that is, supplies the different organs and can alter the function of those organs depending on the electrical activity that flows from the brain. The hormonal side is really through the bloodstream and is a chemical mediation of organ function, whereas the nervous system, through electrical signals that are conducted through the nerves that leave the spinal cord that innovate all the tissues, can actually give a kind of instantaneous change in the function of that particular organ. So if my hormonal system is messed up in my body, will I have brain issues as well? You're absolutely right that the function of your glands that produce hormones uh, can influence the body, but they also can influence the way that the brain works. Mm. So there is a bi-directional communication occurring 
if you, for example, overproduce certain hormones, and a good example would be uh, the thyroid gland, if it overworks, and that affects about 3% of the population, if you have an overactive thyroid, that can have a profound impact on the way that your brain works. Mm. So it, it will make you more irritable, it may increase your anxiety, make real difficulties in sleeping, for example, and relaxing, and make you jittery and nervous. So these are the same hormones released from one gland can impact on the way the brain actually works. But vice versa, the brain can also directly influence the way that these glands work. So are you saying if I'm experiencing a lot of anxiety or moodiness, it could just be cause my hormonal imbalance rather than I'm a terrible person in a sense? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. It cannot be generalized is that each individual has a specific susceptibility to the effects of their hormones. So for example, if we take women who get premenstrual syndrome, who become dysphoric before they have a period. Mm. Not all women suffer that. It's a relative minority, perhaps 20-30%, mm. uh, in whom it's very intrusive and has an impact on their quality of life. So there is an individual susceptibility to the effects of hormones. There's no evidence that these women who experience these symptoms produce different quantities of hormones. It's their response to those hormones which are different. And that makes this quite a challenging area to, to work in and to help patients. Is there some people just born with more voltage, like power in their brain? Some people born with less. Uh, those voltage can be influenced or improved over time if I do certain interventions or even exercise for my brain? The overall activity, the voltage, the electrical changes which occur over the brain, you're kind of born with. And, and that those will change during the day, during wake, during sleep. When you open, when you close your eyes, for example, as was demonstrated in your own results. So that, that's not, that is invariable. That affects all people at all times. Uh, it can be influenced, however, you're right, by, for example, drinking coffee, drinking alcohol, whether you have been under the influence of a sedative, for example. All of those could change the, the voltage, but also the frequency of the electrical activities that you're picking up. So they can be modulated by external factors. But with, even without those external factors, there is a pattern which is discernible mm -hmm. in normal people, which af affects the entire population. Is there any secret that medical professions know that people who are from outside might not know? Aging phenomenon itself is probably a kind of inflammatory syndrome, that is that changes occur within cells and within the whole body, which are probably underpinned by an inflammatory process. And a lot of the cutting edge research in this area is to try to minimize the impact of that inflammatory change. We know that cells, when they metabolize, they produce toxic substances. Mm -hmm. And part of the cutting edge research in this area is to minimize the impact of these molecules that can be damaging to cells. And uh, some of the experimental work that is being undertaken at the moment worldwide is trying to target the kind of these metabolic faults which may compromise long-term health span and lifespan. There are some major studies going on with drugs like metformin, with so-called rapalogs, uh, with drugs such as empagliflozin, which may modulate the kind of damage which is being inflicted by metabolic pathways becoming faulty and poten potentially causing damage. So this is an area that people at the leading edge of longevity medicine are focusing on and it is unfortunately unresolved because you, in order to prove that an intervention is going to be successful, mm. of course may take several decades and as in all things in medicine, whatever intervention you choose to implement, you need to make sure it doesn't harm and it actually produces a good. So you have to have a f an adequate follow-up and this is a real challenge in this area. And throughout your career, if you give our audience one biggest takeaway or one biggest tip in longevity and health, what it will be? This is a really important question. You know, the message is very straightforward. Lead a really healthy lifestyle, mm. sleep well, balance out, be happy and uh, have good nutrition, exercise. These are all kind of fundamentals to good health, but they've also been a proven value in extending health span and lifespan. And that would still be the, the major message. Be able to cope with stress 
yeah. and not have a maladaptive response to stress. Yeah. These are the real secrets and ingredients that will actually enable you to, to live longer. That is, of course, superimposed on where, what your genetic makeup is. Mm -hmm. If you come from a family where people live to be very old, you're already starting off at an advantage. Thank you for your sharing today, Professor Bulu. It's a pleasure. Thank you for watching the Humanware project. To help us to get more amazing content out there, please subscribe. It means a lot and it will help us to grow. And let's go on this journey together. <laughs>